Cool. Okay, so I'm just going to leave it a few minutes um, and see. Uh, yeah, we're still getting some a steady stream of people joining, uh, and then I'll say a few words, and then we'll go over to Pedro. Um, one thing I will say: if you're happy to turn your your videos on, uh, please do. Um, it, it's so much nicer when we can see a bunch of people as we're all uh, all still in in the same room, um, just like we used to with the uh, the events. Um, but obviously, if you don't have the technology or you'd rather not, uh, then that's fine. And given these are lunchtime lightning talks, they are intentionally informal. So eat your lunch, have kids walking past, whatever. We actually had a guy, was it Carsten last, last time, who, whose cat made an appearance, I think, in the middle of his, his talk. So that's the kind of, that's the level of professionalism we're, we're aiming for on, on this one. So anything goes. Nice. <laughs> 32, 25. And Dom Carlo is now here. Dom, I'm going to be making you a co-host as well. Okay, so I'm just going to say a few words then, um, just for anybody joining that is their, their first event, uh, or for anybody watching afterwards. Um, so thanks for, thanks for tuning in. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Barry Cranford. I'm the, I'm the founder of the, the LJC. Uh, I'm not actually a developer myself. I'm a recruiter. I run a, a recruitment company called, uh, called RecWorks. Um, so if you've not come across RecWorks, you've not worked with us, our, our belief is that recruitment can be a force of good in the industry beyond just placing people in jobs and specifically around around mentoring and learning and and, and personal development um, so put simply if people are out there that want to learn and people are out there that, that are happy to share or happy to teach we're happy to make the connections or, or, or put platforms in place to, uh, to to make that happen um so we see our workers sitting somewhere between giving back to people that we've, we've worked with in the past and, and paying forward to uh, relationships with people that we, we hope to work with in the future. Uh, so a few examples of, of what we've done now. Uh, we've run over 500 events for engineers and developers within the LJC, but also students, graduates, CTOs. Um, we've run hackathons, conferences, all sorts of things in this space. Uh, we've, run, uh, we've, we've made, I think, over 2,250 introductions between mentors and mentees. So one-to-one -one personal introductions uh, through our meet and mentor framework. Um, and we've, uh, we've done a load of other things in this kind of space. Uh, and one of, the, one of the key things is giving opportunities to a lot of new speakers. Um, so we're currently working on an initiative that I know a lot of you would have, um, would have heard me talking about around trying to encourage this new diverse generation of, of speakers, um, both within the LJC and beyond. And this event is part of that movement. Um, so we're, we're doing this as a chance to, to give people a chance to practice and um, to get feedback on what they're doing uh, and, and bringing in specialists to do Q&As and loads of other stuff like that. So anyway, if you're interested in joining our group, you're interested in getting involved at all, then come and find me afterwards. You can find me on LinkedIn, on Twitter or any, anywhere else. Send me an email. Um, I'm happy to help. So approaching 12.35, so I'm going to hand over to our first victim, Pedro. Um, so, Pedro, you're on uh, 1235, one remote, all remote, 11 tips for effective remote meetings. Um, so I will, uh, I'll let you go and I'll, I'll hit the timer. Thank you. I can't share my screen right now. Uh, it says it's disabled by host. Maybe you need to make a host or something. Okay. I don't know why. That hasn't happened before. Uh, advanced sharing options. Here we go. All participants, who can start? How about now? That looks better. There we go. Okay. Cool. Okay, so please tell me if you can see my, my slides, but I'm assuming that you can. Yeah. Cool, okay, well, so my name is Pedro Lopez and my presentation is called uh, One Remote, All Remote. And today, just for you, I'm going to do the doodle version, which basically means that I added doodles to some of the slides just for fun and hopefully to make you remember these 11 tips for effective remote meetings a bit better. So this was originally intended as a compilation of suggestions to promote a one remote or remote approach to meetings, hence the name, which means that when you have a meeting where half of the people is in the office and half of the people is working from home, instead of using room equipment like big room monitors or omnidirectional microphones that can make the experience less than ideal for remote attendees, if one person joins remotely, everyone does. I can also say that during COVID-19 lockdown, I've confirmed with my team that all of these apply to a full remote setup as well. And also, as, as we start going back to normality, some people will return to the office from day one, while others will stay home for a bit longer. 
as a result, hybrid team configurations like the one this presentation was originally intended to address will be very common for a while or maybe forever. So now more than ever, these tips might be relevant to you too. All right, so very quickly about me, as I said, I'm Pedro Lopez, engineering manager, and I really like to travel. I like it so much that I ended up working at a company called Skyscanner. But today I'm not here to tell you about Skyscanner. Uh, I'm here to tell you about remote working. Everything I'm going to say today is also available as a blog post in retrolog.io, so feel free to check it out if you liked it or if you want to know more about other things that I occasionally write about. Small disclaimer, some of these tips might look obvious at first, but you would be surprised with how many times I've seen people not doing these things in remote meetings. So hopefully you will find at least some of them interesting nonetheless. Okay, so uh, let's start. First tip, use headphones. Any type of headphones is fine, but noise cancelling ones work best, obviously, because they provide with a higher level of sound isolation. Think about the hybrid environment we mentioned earlier. If there is more than one attendee in the same room because of the lag, you might want to set the volume high enough so that it's not distracting to hear other person speaking in the same room and getting the sound from two different sources. But not too high, please, because you'll still need your ears after the meeting, safety first. And this obviously also applies when you live with other people that might also be in a meeting or maybe even in the same meeting if you live with co-workers, who knows? There is an exception if you are in a phone booth um, in the office. I don't think you have phone booths at home, but if you do, kudos to you. Or you are the only person in the room, feel free to use your laptop, internal microphone and speakers or equivalents. But consider double checking that there is no uh, undesired echo for everyone else in the call. Second tip, use a camera. General rules for remote meetings still apply. Doesn't matter for remote or hybrid, and it's generally better to see the person speaking, as Barry was saying earlier. If your laptop is connected to external monitors, please make sure that you either have an external webcam or you keep your laptop lid open during the call so that you can use the laptop camera. And consider enabling your camera by default or turn it on right after joining the call, but feel free to disconnect the, the video temporarily, though, if you are not speaking or if the signal is bad, because it can help. Number three, if you are not speaking, please mute yourself. This is one of those that we all probably keep seeing over and over again. And this is paramount in a setup where multiple people is in the same room joining the same call. Otherwise, the audio experience will be very bad due to unwanted echo. Depending on the configuration of the meeting, the host can also mute all the participants if needed. Extra tip, you can use the mute microphone when joining a meeting setting that you can surely find in the preferences menu of your video conferences tool of choice. Number four, consider using the raise hand functionality to indicate that you want to talk. In a remote setup, it's hard to see when someone has the intention to speak, particularly when the screen is shared. Uh, you might be hidden in the gallery if there's many people in the call. One effective way to tackle this is to use the raise hand uh, functionality, and this is available in tools like Zoom, for example. If yours doesn't have it, you can use the chat as a last resort. And if the number of people in the call is small, typically less than five people, this might not be necessary. Next, number five, every meeting needs a facilitator. And if you don't know who, it, who that is, it's probably you. Uh, you need someone to tell others to mute themselves if they don't realize and to coordinate who speaks, who speaks with, when the conversation doesn't flow naturally. The facilitator in this particular case could just be the meeting host, but in large meetings, it might make sense to get some help. And as a rule of thumb, if there is no clearly designated facilitator, please just jump in and help, especially in team meetings, people will generally appreciate it. All right, six, font size matters. You might have your laptop connected to high resolution monitors at home or in the office, but most attendees and more so the ones working from home probably won't. Some might even be uh, using a monitor, uh, like a room monitor and looking at the screen from a distance. Also, the image will not be as crisp because of video compression. So be mindful of this and zoom in a little, please. And uh, this applies to every tool or tab that you switch to, not just the first one, remember that. Seventh, uh, divide and conquer using breakout rooms. This feature is definitely available in Zoom and hopefully other enterprise level video conferencing solutions also have something like this or some kind of workaround. For example, Google Meet, Google Hangouts didn't have this last time I checked, but it was possible to have multiple calls in parallel. So anything like this is not ideal, but would do. This is especially useful for brainstorming topics that are too complex to discuss with a large audience. You break down the topic into questions, divide up people into groups to work on those questions, and then regroup and share learnings. It's a very useful, very useful tool. Eight, and be mindful of time and let others have a chance to speak. A facilitator could help with this by intervening when someone is dominating the discussion and not leaving enough time for others to express their opinions. 
This is more difficult to do in a remote setting as body language cues do not work as well there. So everyone just needs to be more aware and understanding of each other. The raise hand feature could help because it encourages people to pass the mic more. And other formats like silent brainstorming and Zoom breakout rooms also can ensure everyone can contribute even if they are not very vocal. Number nine, virtual backgrounds. They're really cool, but also for those that are working from home and are worried about accidental photo bombs by their housemates or partners or kids in the background, this offers an extra layer of privacy. If you want some ideas for virtual backgrounds, it's a very active topic on Reddit, so you can check it out for some inspiration and there's a link right there. Number 10, ask for feedback. You can't see people as clearly when everyone is joining remotely and cramped in a small gallery of thumbnails, so there's less visual feedback. So it's okay to pause during presentations to ask if anyone has questions or participants, sorry, uh, um, or ask participants a big thumbs up or a verbal yes or no is much more noticeable than a nod or a, hat or a subtle head shake. So is, is this clear? Yes. <laughs> okay, so see my points? So it's hard. I, I'm not seeing you right now, so it's hard for me to see. Cool. I, I can hear that someone uh, unmuted themselves to answer. So well, thanks for the intention. Cool. Uh, and finally, number 11. Uh, if you have a corporate VPN, VPN etiquette still applies. Disconnect from it when joining a remote meeting. Otherwise, you will be using precious, uh, precious bandwidth and likely affect the, affecting others that might need it. And your connection might improve a little bit as well if you do so. And that's it. 11 tips for effective remote meetings in emojis that you can print and hang on your wall if you want. And thank you very much for listening and also huge thanks to my team that helped me put this together. I uh, don't think there's time for questions, but uh, you can just ping me on Twitter later on. If you have any, I'll be happy to answer there. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Pedro. Um, guys, I'm going to do something here. I'm going to try something. Um, I don't know if this is going to work or not. So can everyone please just unmute themselves for a second or, or a sample of you do it and clap. It's one of the things that we've missed the most. I'll take that cloud up as if, as if it was for me, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you know what? It's one of the things I miss the most about these, these Zoom sessions is like when I hand over to somebody in a live session, we clap and everyone, and it gets a bit of energy going and, and it feels good for a speaker. But with this, it's all so, so muted. So, um, okay, uh, we've got two minutes until our next speaker, uh, which is John. Um, John, I don't know if you want to um, share, share your screen and, and start going. So that's ready to go at 12.45. For everyone else, um, you should have had an email from Mel or Dom about collecting feedback. So. A big part of this is uh, trying to get some feedback for the speakers. Um, so if anyone's got any time, you should have a, um, a link that was sent to you. Dom, Carlo, if you're out there and can hear me, can you post the link on the chat? Um, if you've got just, we're gonna have two minutes between each session just to collect a few notes so you can um, let Pedro know how, how that went, um, any, any, anything that you then thought went particularly well, um, any areas of development, anything like that. Um, it's really good for, uh, for, for people to know. So obviously some of our speakers are more experienced than others, um, but either way, getting into speaking is crushing and, and feedback really helps. Um, so if you've got any, any thoughts at all, any points you can make at all, please do um, add them now. Uh, and then we've got about 30 seconds um, for John. John, are you, are you sharing the screen or are you going straight? Hold on. You are, you are planning to share, okay. Cool. I'm planning to share. Um, All good. No, that's, that's fine, still got a minute or so. And also for the speakers, I'm gonna be holding these up as well. I, you might've seen the last one. They weren't. Uh, it's wrong way around. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my wife has thankfully done some new ones. So they'll be on five and seven minutes and we'll come in at eight minutes. So, can you see the screen or not? Not at this point. Uh, nope. Okay, right. Well, let's just share that one. Beautiful. Is it? Yeah, right. absolutely. Go ahead. Okay, I'll start my little timer. <laughs> um, basically, so I'm trying to encourage people to come to the dark side and go to uh, the hardware. Um, this is sort of a really sort of a, a talking about how you can use convert your software 
to go even faster by making it into hardware. So um, that's why I've sort of talked to you, um, said the title of being baking software or turning software into hardware. So next slide. Um, you've got sort of like two sort of um, software versus hardware ways of doing it. In software, you're going to be loading a variable at a time, then the next variable, and then the next one in your code. And then you'll generate some value from these, which you can then store um, into the variables again. With hardware, you can do the same sort of thing, but in parallel. And I'm not, I'm sort of not talking about sort of in software, about threads, etc. This really is in parallel. You can load all the software variables at the same time and generate the new value and then store all parallel values again into variables. So what I wanted to do is to use a cyclic buffer as an example. Um, basically, it was prompted by, I think it's Alex McNeil gave a talk about cyclic buffers in Java. So I'm talking about cyclic buffers when you use them in lexical analyzers, where you store the lexical tokens, like the keywords, begin, end, if, repeat, while, identifiers, such as the user, um, add as a name, and you also store comments, and it's got to hold at least two tokens. Okay, so what do we need of the, this hardware? It must be big enough to store two tokens, the next token and the previous token. Um, be careful about comments because that's um, about essays, um, if they make them too big. You've got to be able to show the buffer memory overflow. In other words, you haven't got enough memory inside it. You want to have tokens to be as big as possible. In other words, identifiers could have reserved keywords. You, with the hardware, you don't really want to move strings of characters at a time, but just use one character at a time and only use one character of looking ahead uh, and put characters in and out at the same speed. So, Here's a uh, architecture prepared earlier, where you really want to have four buffers, token was, token buffer, um, token is, token valid. I hope you can all see these and they're not too small as per our first speak. Um, you've got each buffer has really two pointers. Where do they start and where do they end? So the token was starts here and actually ends there, but the end pointer is the one after the last character. So there's only two characters in this one. It means that you can have, uh, you can work out how long the token is by saying end minus start. Usually fixed, um, but I've done been doing some experiments and about 4K is way, uh, 4K location is well enough to store uh, lexical tokens. Also got two extra tokens, um, which are the token base, token limit, where these represent the start and end pointers. So a token base could be the token was start and the limit could be the token was end or the um, token is against the token is start versus token is end. Token address again indicates um, the uh, when you're going out, out putting the characters from the beginning of a string to the end. So it would indicate firstly the token was then the next character and eventually you realize that when you get to the token was end, okay, there's nothing end. So what scenarios are going to be using this? Um, effectively, these are the scenarios where you're going to be tweaking the various buffer pointers. So when you initialize the buffer, in other words, the token was start, token was end, equals the token buffer start, token is start, are all set to zero, where you've got the zero address. Okay, um, using one character for the look ahead, and basically there will be some spaces inside the memory which will be used but not part of a token, uh, part of a token string. So, another example here of showing the first um, thing what do you do for the initializing the buffer in software? In software, you do five nine actions. In software, you do. Uh, in software, you take nine actions. You're um, loading up 
all the various individual variables into uh, into sort of the, the various registers. Whereas in hardware, you can say, right, start up, set what two um, temporary variables or just wires effectively to be zero, and then you can then um, store those values inside the target other registers. Uh, next one would be the check for empty buffer. I think I'll rush through some of these um, uh, slides because all they're doing is going over, showing, showing the software versus hardware roles. So you've got to, how you write the chart character into a buffer, how do you read it, um, and so on. All the way down to, say, for example, um, you've got a, a token which is valid, but there may be more characters to make it a bigger um, token, probably in the case of uh, words. Then what does this mean in terms of like a, an architecture? Well, you can have the way I have got here, ink bus, read S and read E. These represent sort of like temporary variables or wires where I can send the token buffer start to the ink bus or the token is end to the increment bus and so on for all of these others. Now this was done by analyzing the various um, commands that were available for the um, scenarios. So that would mean that we'd have basically three units here for the um, this cyclic buffer. One, a register unit, which contains all the registers, a memory unit, um, and also an IO unit. So register units, what is inside that? Well, so there'll be these various wires with registers. What would be inside the um, register control? Well, you have these wires which will control what goes onto this read S bus, the read E bus, etc. The cache memory unit would have these registers um, and so on, with the controls given by these. Here's it. The next thing is, as you can see, I used a really good um, drawing tool to show the schematic for the registers for the uh, register units. So you can see here what you've got is the this thing called an S bus, which can go out, the E bus can go out, and you've got these all these pairs of buffer registers uh, feeding in. They can either choose which one you want to go in. You can some of them will have an increment, and then these the sort of like the sort of a trapezium type shapes represent the choices. John, I'm going to have to cut you off. I'm afraid there. We've gone over the eight minutes. Uh, okay, there. sorry about this. That's all right. That's all right. And um, are you okay to answer questions? Maybe hang around uh, at the I end. I can of the... certainly hang around. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. So if anybody has any questions um, for John on any of this, or would like to see the end, um, we'll set John up in a uh, breakout room, um, and you're welcome to to, to join in with that. Um, and hopefully, John, we'll maybe talk to you afterwards about getting those slides available for um, oh yeah for the next one. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Again, guys, if you could unmute, have a quick clap. I'd appreciate that. <laughs> oh, God, it's feeling like back in the old days. I like it. I like it. Um, OK, uh, so Charlie, if you want to start getting your screen set up, then ready to go. Um, I'll just take 30 seconds or, or a minute or so. Um, if anybody has any um, uh, feedback for, for John, if they could fill it in on the form. Uh, Dom, if you can. Um, uh, share the form again. That would be great. Um, yeah, that would be um, uh, that'd be nice. Any 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 positives? Any areas of d development? That would be um, that'd be superb. But yeah, thank you very much for that, John. Really uh, really appreciate that. Um, Charlie, are you there? Are you are you are you ready? To yeah, go? I'm sharing screen. I think. I hope. Beautiful. Yeah, I can see it there. I can see it there. Okay, I'll just get my, uh, my timer set up then. Um, and whenever you're ready, feel free to go. Okay, well, that's me. So, uh, yeah, University of Bradford, superb place back in the 90s, but what, what can you say? Um, so, if I show you uh, this, which, which is um, um, a video 
of an old folk game called Space Invaders. Can you hear the sound or? Can you yeah. hear the sound? Yeah. yeah. That, that's Space Invaders in essence anyway. And you see the, uh, the hordes of aliens coming down, shooting at you, and you've got a set of shields and you've got a gun chip. Okay. So if I look at my version, so I'm just do a. See, that's it there. There's no sound. I haven't mastered sound yet, but um, that's the game in essence with, uh, as you can see, the school, aliens, shields, and um, mystery prize. Um, okay. Can't see it at the moment, I don't think. Have you got, did you get it or not? Was that too quick? Too quick. Too quick? I'll, I'll put it up again. There we go. Can't see it. Can still see the uh, the YouTube. Still see the YouTube. Um, Last for a second and then went away. There we go. That's it. Can you see it now? Yep, can see it now. Yeah. Okay, so that's a new one. Uh, it's all done in Java. So if I um ah, this share screen's a tricky business. Uh where's there we are. Can you see that? Yeah, all good, yeah. All good. Is the text visible? Can you see that? This here? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so th this is essentially the full template of the game. So I, I call it Rocket, you could call it Space Invaders, you could call it whatever you want, but in this case I called it Rocket because I was going to do something else, but I decided to do Space Invaders. Um, so Public Rocket is a constructor and that, that sets up the window listener and the key listener for, for the keyboard commands and also the window listener for closing of the window. And you can see it calls in it, which is down here and it sets up the initial properties of the, uh, the variables. Um, and it's used every loop. Rocket is used once and only once by the main. Um, okay, standard, standard generation of a, um, of a Java ob object from a class. So I've got some classes. Uh, I've got a high scores class. Um, which, as its name implies, prints out the high scores. I've got a score name class, which is the individual elements on that high score class, which is just name and score. And the craft enum is the, as you can see, the mystery craft, the top line, the middle two lines, and the bottom two lines. And those are the scores. There's a class for an explosion. Uh, and that, I can go into some of these if we get time in a bit. Uh, that generates the um, the wow factor from the explosions. It's 200 points that randomly um, fly out. Uh, then there's a craft. Craft is related to the craft enum and is a sort of general purpose bad guy generator. Then there's shield for uh, printing up the shields. There's, there's a gun for printing up the gun. And there's a bullet. Now the bullet is a five element array. First one being the bullets going up and the, the last four coming down. I could have had two different classes, but it seemed a bit of a waste. Um, this here, the buffered image read BI, uh, simply all that is, is uh, something that prevents you multiply loading the same image. So as you can see on here, uh, there were two images um, that are cycled between to give you some sense of animation. Um, but if you were to load up all these objects with the same image, you'll be loading the file, same file again and again and again. So this here prevents that and just stores it once and give you a reference to it, which is the buffered image reference. Paint is very critical and that, that paints, ooh, five minutes. That, that paints the, um, that paints the whole area. 
So with background and uh, aliens and stuff, and calls, these are the classes with a draw method, giving it graphics. High score panel is a J panel with an action listener, and, and that just uh, allows you to enter your high score. My thread, big crap, I should have called it control, um, but uh, it's the main controller. Uh, craft collisions works out the collisions between bullets and the craft, return to craft or null. And then main is the uh, entry point that starts it off. So we're not going to get time to go through the code itself, but that's, that's a general template. So the, the my thread is the key and does the control logic. And the paint is the thing that displays all these elements. Um, yeah, I don't think I've got time, but I'll go on to the, uh, yeah, I'll go on to the, um, thing that I want you guys to do, which is that one. Can you oh, see we're that? Still, we're still seeing the dark fire. Oh, no. no, we're not. We're not looking at the game. We're just looking at the dark file, the word. That one. There we go. At last. We'll end on that. It showed the main fantastic explosions, which I've done in the uh, Space Invaders game. And this is the uh, well known Defenders game. And that's, that I think is my lot. Brilliant. Thanks, Charlie. Is, is, that's, that's the, the close of the talk. Okay, I'm just going to eat my pizza. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. You know, you can miss in between the things, but never mind. You know? Zoom does have a funny way of, uh, of, of, of really uh, throwing all these, these curveballs. Um, yeah. We have events that we start that for randomly don't record. We have others that, that, like at the beginning, you couldn't share your screen. So I just blame Zoom for that kind of thing. Yeah, I blame Zoom. Better to be blame Zoom. To. I, did, I did try. It did, it did work. And it I did. Had to, Cut it down a bit, but um, yeah, it, uh, I was going to show you some of the code, but there's probably no point. It would go over people's heads, maybe. I don't know. Well, if you're here at the end and, and, uh, and you can stick to the end and people, people want to um, have a chat with you there, then obviously they can do so through the, um, uh, through the, the chat mechanism there. Um, and yeah, so any questions, fire them through. Any feedback, please do use that form that Dom Carlos posted a few times on the chat. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, and we have Mag next, don't we? Do you want so me to stay Mag. around? Pardon, Charlie? Do you want me to stay around? Can you stay around, did you say? Yeah, do you want, do you want me to stay around? If, if that's okay, if, you, if you're around to, till the end. Um, I've, if, I've if, got stuff to do, but um, I can hold it off, so, you know. Okay, I'll tell you what then, if anybody would like Charlie to stay around, please do um, write to them through the chat directly in a direct message. Um, and then you can make a decision from there. Um, and if you don't hear in the next five minutes, then... Um, then you can you, you can make a decision from there. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, Mag's next. Mag, you're not sharing a screen, are you? Just my face. Just your you're camera. You're all very lucky to Brilliant. have this wonderful experience. <laughs> well, I'll give it another 30 seconds or so to get any feedback. Again, for anybody that's tuned in um, in the last uh, last 10 minutes since I since I said it. Um, a big part of these events is to try and get feedback for for speakers. So if anybody has got any feedback, there's some some forms there. Um, yeah, please do please do leave it. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, anyway, right, Max, I'll um, I'll, I'll put over to yourself. Thank you, Barry. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, spending your lunch break listening to us speakers. Um, my name is Mag Leahy, and I've been a technologist in London for the last 20 years, which is quite a long time considering I have the mental age of a 12 year old. Um, so I've been, um, my expertise basically lies in the front end. So I've been coding with Angular, TypeScript and um, state management of NGXS most recently. And my time has mostly been spent in London and I have been a contractor. So I've had the opportunity to 
change teams and industries and cultures many times and I'm a noticer so I've built up uh, levels of noticing things over those 20 years and in the time that we're in at the moment it is a time where we're sort of given uh, an opportunity to pause and reflect as well on where we're at and that's certainly what I'm doing within myself and I'm looking at uh, the 20 years that have passed and I'm looking towards the 20 years that I have ahead of me and I, you know, have had a really great career to date and I love coding and I love being in the tech space and I think it's a wonderful environment in which to spend one's career. Um, but I'm also looking at the next 20 years and um, what, where I feel I fit within that. And I'm pondering and I'm thinking about the future. So I'm going to tell you a story which is going to appear completely irrelevant to the tech industry and it's going to be about cycling. Um, so I am a cyclist and I've started cycling my road bike, which I purchased about a year and a quarter ago. Um, her name is Kit and she's a black specialized road bike. They're terrifying things and it's a terrifying experience, but you get used to it as with all things like public speaking. Um, so I wanted to tell you a story about me doing a 70k ride on Wednesday, um, which involved me going around in circles in Regent's Park to get up the, uh, the, the basically kilometers. And I want you to think about my experience and I'll give you some hints to help you set a lovely scene. I've gone full midlife crisis and I have, you know, the Lycra gear, and I'd like to say that a lot of it is functional, so I batter your judgment back, um, and a lot of it is midlife crisis, so it's a wonderful experience. But what happened to me, and think about my experience in your mind about what that looks like, was I was at a tricky part of the ride where um, it's a lot of traffic and a lot of cyclists convening together and pedestrians, and you have to pay attention, and you go from uh, speed to kind of quieter times and back to speed again and this young girl was standing um over her bike uh, on the footpath looking at me and she had a moment very much of seeing me and acknowledging me and we had a shared experience of seeing each other and having our own thoughts within our own brains and I was that little girl at one point and I was looking outward for um role models and inspiration and uh, things that normalized for me and things that I aspired to be and things that I aspired not to be. So in that moment, it really helped me uh, focus on my future as well, because um, I don't know how you pictured me in the scenario that I was painting, but I was very much a minority um, being female, which I am also as a coder in technology. And I am uh, reiterating that I've found that space to be quite an encouraging space. And I've made wonderful friends over the years, but it is dominated in numbers by uh, white males. And um, this brings me to um, like me on the bike. I'm equally, because I'm female, I'm uh, a minority, but also there was hardly any other diversity within the group. And what I want to do moving forward is I want to be a team creator and a leader and a coaching leader at that because I want to empower people to um, be the best they can be themselves um, to realize their abilities with a little help from me. I want to be a voice of fairness and kindness because I think our tech world is an opportunity and Barry you've touched on this with your intro of really making a positive change not only through technology but also through how we behave to each other. And I mean, we're probably in this group, we have a diversity range and we don't all see things the same way and we haven't had the same experiences. So moving forward, I wanna think about um, collaborating teams, teams that are strong because they see each other and they see how they're different from each other and they embrace that difference to create better products and better relationships and better viewpoints and they see edge cases differently. And I want us to be empowered to really um, be good people in our tech world. And that will obviously echo out and be noticers and to notice um, 
the differences and to empower each other and to be kind. And when I look back over my career, like I have a lot of friendships that are my deep, deep friendships. And when I think of my ideal environment, it's one that is kind and considerate and very, very collaborative. And that benefits the product, it benefits the business, but more importantly, it benefits us as human beings. Um, so I want to empower you to know to be aware and to be a voice of kindness and support of each other within tech. And I just wanted to leave you with um, two book recommendations, if you're interested, that I've read that have helped me to see others' viewpoints. Um, one is Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race from Rennie Eddy Lodge, Edo Lodge, pardon me. And the other one is Better Allies, um, which is uh, the viewpoint of a woman in tech, but also of any minority in tech. And we're all minorities in some way, but we can really empower each other. So I just wanted to, um, with everything that's going on in the world, uh, to put that thought in your head that we can be a really meaningful part of positive change within our workspaces. And I thank you for your time. The last time I gave a public speech was when I was 12, so it was 30 years ago, and basically I had to be walked off the stage in stage fright. So I think this one went slightly better today. And I appreciate your time and mind yourselves in this new world. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Meg. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, again, everybody, if you could um, pop some some feedback down. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming forward. Mag actually answered my my call when I was uh, I wrote. Was it this week, Mag? That I said, would you mind coming through? So thank you for stepping. I really appreciate that as well. My pleasure. Um, I'll, I'll drop the uh, link there. And if Carsten is out there, if you want to get your screen uh, set up and ready, so that we're good to go in a few minutes. Um, Hang on a second, I'll get this link out. There we go. Carsten, I know I can see you. Yeah, good, that's fine. I'm sure the day is going to come soon when I'm going to ask somebody and they're just not going to be out there and someone else will have to just uh, do a random five minutes. Okay, so thank can you. Can you see my screen? Can see your screen, can see your screen. Give us two minutes just to, to collect a bit of feedback and then we'll kick that off at, at 1.15. I must say, booking them in, for, for anybody that was here at the last one, um, this is going much smoother from my perspective at least um, because with these, with these allocated times and the, the, the five minute warnings. How are you finding that as the, as the speakers, Charlie, John, uh, Mag, Pedro, with the, with the signs, is that, is that okay? Good, you gave me the kick. Good. Get on to the next bit, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's like, what... oh my god, I've got to find the window. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? It's it's crazy when when you sort of, you think, yeah, I've probably been speaking for about two minutes, and 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 yeah, your, your time's nearly up. It's, um, yeah, it is difficult on uh, on lightning talks. I Google hate interrupting meets people. A lot better. Google you... meets a lot better. It's the window on top that gets uh, gets viewed. So yeah. when you share your desktop, you you just share. The window on top so that, that's what i was doing mm. and uh, of course i had to select it it's difficult finding it when you've only got a thumbnail that's right yeah right cast and then we'll, we'll we'll kick off if you're if you're good to go if you're ready uh yes i am <clears throat> cool well, i'll start my timer so let me share my screen So you should be seeing my presentation now. <clears throat> uh, do you guys see it? Can you just yep, tell good. me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, so thank you, Barry. And the next seven minutes, I want to tell you how you can get better spring food projects faster with J Hipster. So if you want to get the slides for this talk, you just type in this URL or you just take a picture of this QR code. I'm gonna show this very slide at the end again. So, and also send the URL around. So, are you struggling with Angular, React, NoSQL, or microservices? Are you unsure how DevOps, containers, and cloud impact Java? 
can't you find any good online training for these new technologies? Well, then look no further because Jay Hipster has your back. Jay Hipster gives you better Spring Boot projects faster and it saves you time in learning in your project and in, the, in your code. So what is Jay Hipster? Well, first of all, it's for new projects only, so you can't add it to existing projects. And it's an open source command line tool that creates a full Spring Boot monolith or microservice application. And it can also create, create, read, update, delete screens for your front end and back end for your entities, for your data, you know, like your data model. So full application and uh, CRUD screens. It can also update your platform and library, uh, libraries, which is uh, potentially painful with the tool, but you know, it's a good idea to keep all these dependencies up to date. So in other words, JHipster is like having a superstar developer on your team that writes all the plumbing code that nobody wants to do and that picks, configures, and integrates the best library and tools. You know, that's, you know, that could be a huge time sink. So let me show you some screens from a sample JHipster application. Here we've got the uh, Angular application with the nav bar from Bootstrap and the ability to switch languages at any time. This is a typical master screen here for the built-in user administration. You see the data and on the right you have the links to go to view and edit. This is an admin screen you get for free. You see the JVM metrics here. You see you know, details about your memory, about your threads, about the CPU usage, and down there you see stuff about the garbage collection. Here, this screen gives you some details about your REST API endpoints. You can see them listed here, how often they're being called and how long they take to execute. This screen gives you some details about your um, Hibernate cache. Oops. And this screen here shows you your spring configuration. So all your spring properties configuration you can search for the configuration in the top left and you see all the values that the application currently has while running here in the bottom. This one here is one that I especially like. It allows you to set the debug level, or sorry, the log level of any of your 1489 loggers here in this particular application at runtime. So you can switch from you know debug to info to warn. At runtime, it becomes effective immediately. And the Last screen here that I want to show you is the audit screen so you can see which user logged in when or tried to log in when. So that concludes the uh, list of the admin screens. So those are just some of the screens that JHipster gives you for free. So some more details. JHipster is the number one Java code generator. I had about 174,000 downloads in the last 30 days. It doesn't add a custom runtime, so it's not like Grails or Rails or any of those things. It just has some small libraries. You get a Spring Boot to the two application with Java 8 and 11 on Maven or Gradle. You can build a reactive application with Spring Webflow or just a traditional one with servlets. Front end is Angular or React. Authentication, you've got three choices, uh, JWT, OAuth2 or session-based. For messaging, you get Messaging and search, you get Kafka, WebSockets, and Elasticsearch. You've got various SQL and NoSQL choices here. I'm going to just give you a moment to read them. Unit tests, the JHipster creates unit tests with Java and JavaScript. JHipster also creates JUnit tests for integration in Java. You get acceptance tests, browser tests generated with Protractor. So you can test your application automatically running. It configures Cucumber for you, but you have to write the Cucumber tests yourself. Same for load tests. Gatling is included, which is a framework, and it's configured, but you still have to write the tests yourself. Those are the continuous integration choices that JHipster supports out of the box. And these are the cloud deployment choices that you get. I think Azure was being added as well. I'm not sure because one of the core J hipster guy was hired by Microsoft. For monitoring, it supports Elasticsearch and Prometheus. And 
just uh, two more notes. Number one is you can disable generation of front end and user administrations. If you don't like the built-in UI, you can just put in your own and just have a REST endpoint then and everything behind it being generated the back end. The same is true for user administration. And you can always customize DJ Hipster generated code. You know, it's not a separate runtime environment. It's just, you know, Spring Boot Angular code. So how can you use J Hipster? You can use it in four different ways. You can use it, number one, uh, to build Spring Boot projects for production. You know, instead of writing a Spring Boot project yourself, you just use J Hipster for it. That's what I've done. You can um, build a J Hipster project in parallel to your pro production project and then just copy code over, like how to uh, do JavaScript tests or how to integrate Spring Security with Angular. You can build two projects to compare code. So if you want to have a choice between technologies like SQL versus NoSQL, oops, oops, sorry. Um, I'm going to just leave it like this. If you have, uh, you know, compare, uh, compare code, then uh, you can have live working code instead of just reading articles. And if you like live working code, then you can also, um, you know, use that to learn these technologies. So, oops, and the last slide that I wanted to show is the same slide as the beginning, oops, so, a uh, little proper. So, JHipster gives you better Spring Boot projects faster and it saves time in learning and project and code. So, if you're interested, I've got a JHipster tutorial and you can find it here at this link. And again, you can find the slides here. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Carsten. Appreciate that, mate. Lovely <laughs> slides. Um, and that's your, your third one so far. Is that right, Carsten? Yep. Brilliant. Yep. You're becoming, you're becoming a regular here. I like it. Thank you again, Carsten. We had a dropout last minute. So uh, Carsten stepped up and, and, and filled a gap. So yeah, really appreciate that. Um, okay, guys, that is the end of our lightning talk. So, um, firstly, thank you to everybody that has uh, that has spoken. This is good. We're we're seven minutes early. Last week or last time we did it, I think we were forty minutes over by this point. Um, so this was this was far more realistic um, in terms of the the numbers. Um, again, uh, the feedback. Uh, Dom's already done it. Thank you, Dom. Um, I've just been looking through the feedback, actually. I've just sent it to some of the speakers. Guys, thank you so much for, for submitting. We've already had about 15 um, submits on there, which is just amazing. It's just, just so good to actually get that, um, that feedback. Um, the, the speakers and any experienced speaker will tell you to get that feedback. It just, uh, just really expedites any kind of learning. Um, it, it helps in confidence of what you've done done right, um, which any new speaker always it will, will, will struggle with, and it helps in uh, in which areas specifically to develop in. Um, so at this point, we are going to go into breakout rooms. Uh, so if you only came for the lightning talks, um, then that's absolutely fine. You are free to go. Um, but if you like, we, we, we tried doing this with the London CTOs, and it works like a charm. Um, it's, it's a really nice way to, these, these breakout sessions are a really nice way to just kind of take everyone and, and put them into these, these smaller groups. It's like a, a traditional conferences um, where the, the real magic happens after the events and you get chatting about, oh, what did you think of that and, and what have you, um, which I think was what led to the unconference thing in general. It's that, that same thing that we, you, you can go some way to recreate with these breakout rooms. Um, so I'm going to hit the breakout room button. Um, now, Don, do we have a, um, uh, a, a Google Doc that has the different, do we have different room hosts? I wasn't sure if we got there or not. Uh, yeah, we've got three rooms uh, with three hosts. Um, we've got Carsten, yep. who is going to be hosting, let me just get the uh, mobile clients with the Java backend. Uh, John is going to be taking questions about his talk, Baking Software, and Charlie will um, continue with his Introducing Space Invaders talk as well, if anyone has any questions. Real. Okay, so I'm going to set up four breakout rooms. The admin might take me a little bit of time, but I'll make sure that those hosts... Dom, can you send me the, um, a Google Doc or something with, with who's, in, who's in which rooms? Um, if anybody would like to be added to a specific room, 
Um, you can either put it on the chat, the general chat, or put it to me directly, and I'll, I'll get you into that room. Um, but yeah, other than that, thank you for, thank you for coming. Um, thanks for getting involved. Thanks for giving some feedback. If anybody has any feedback on uh, my part or RecWorks part or anything like that, just use the same feedback form and put my name in there. I'd love to hear of anything that I could do better or any way that we could make this better for you. Um, yeah, and, and, and I'll see you next time. So I'll hit the breakout room button now. <laughs>